when I I talk. Um, the title of my talk is a mirror structure constants via non-Archimedean analytic disks. It's based on my previous work and the work in progress with Sean Kiel. Um, since we are not many people here, please do not hesitate to interrupt me and ask questions whenever you want. Okay. Um, you hear me okay? Yeah, I I think it's good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So here's a plan of my talk. I will begin with motivations from uh, the SYZ conjecture and the HMS conjecture in mirror symmetry. I will give a review of these two conjectures. And then I will explain the heuristics behind the mirror structure constants. After that, I will introduce the non-Archimedean SYZ vibration. Uh, and then I will talk about boundary conditions uh, for counting uh, disks. Uh, and after that, I will move to a little bit more uh, uh, details uh, of the story. Uh, so properness of the moduli space, ingredients in the proof of the main theorem. And finally, I will say something about comparison with punctured logaromorphism invariants by uh, Abramovich, Chen Gross, and Siebert. So let me begin with uh, motivations from uh, SYZ and HMS. Yeah, uh, I just uh, begin with a quick review. Uh, a smooth projective variety X over C is called Calabial if its canonical bundle KX is trivial. In other words, uh, if it has a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So we have basic examples uh, of Calabial, uh, elliptic curves, abelian variety, K3 surface, hypersurface of degree D plus one in CPD, for example. Then uh, mirror symmetry is a conjectural duality between Calabial varieties. Um, roughly, it predicts that for any Calabial variety X, there exists a mirror variety X check, such that a, a list of deep geometric relations hold between X and X check. Um, it involves Hodge structures, Gromov-Witten invariants, Fukaya categories, derived category of coherent shifts, SYZ torus vibration, etc. I mentioned the many names. If you are not familiar, it's okay. I'm just saying that mirror symmetry, it's a conjectural duality between Calabial varieties so that we have lots of relations between these two, this pair. Um, yeah, here is the classical example involving, involving Hodge numbers. We have HPQ of X equal to H uh, dimension minus PQ of X check. So in this three dimensional case, we have we get this symmetry of Hodge numbers shown in this famous uh, diagram uh, computed by Candelas and uh, collaborators. So that's what roughly uh, mirror symmetry is about. Um, then we have two main conjectures in mirror symmetry. One is called the SYZ conjecture, named after Strominger, Yaw, Zaslo, and Zaslo. And another is the HMS conjecture. Uh, it's it's short for homological mirror symmetry by Kondosevich. These are the two main conjectures in the field. Uh, let me review the rough idea of these two conjectures. So here is the rough idea of the SYZ conjecture. Um, it has two parts. First part, it says that in certain asymptotic sense, the Calabial manifold X should admit some torus vibration like this uh, called SYZ vibration. So we have some base and some torus fiber um, and possibly some singular fibers too. So that's the first part. It's about existence of this vibration. And the second part is about how to construct the mirror manifold. So they conjecture that the mini mirror manifold uh, X check should be constructed. They conjecture that the mirror Calabial manifold X check should be constructed by first taking the dual torus vibration. So we take a dual vibration and the next we do some modification using specific counts of holomorphic disks. 
uh, called instant on corrections. So they say that it's not enough just to take the dual torus vibration. We should also count this kind of disks called instant on corrections and then modify the dual torus vibration. That's the uh, very classical conjecture. And uh, next, let me review the other big conjecture in mirror symmetry, this HMS conjecture. So you can think of the SYZ conjecture as a geometric, con like conjecture about the geometric aspect of mirror symmetry. Then the S HMS conjecture is a conjecture about the uh, algebraic side of mirror symmetry. Um, in particular, it gives for this Calabria pair, it associates to them, uh, to the pair, uh, some algebraic invariant. One is called the Fukaya category. It's a category whose objects are Lagrangian submanifolds uh, with some decorations, and morphisms are given by holomorphic disks uh, with boundaries on Lagrangians. And for the mirror X check, we consider another invariant, uh, the category of coherent sheaves. Then uh, the homological mirror symmetry conjecture uh, predicts an equivalence of these two categorical invariants uh, after passing to derived categories. So that's the algebraic, that's the it's homological mirror symmetry conjecture describing the algebraic invariance of the mirror duality. Um, a very basic question in this mirror uh, symmetry story is how do we construct this mirror variety X check? So mirror symmetry predicts the existence of the mirror and then the long list of geometric relations. Um, a basic question is how do we construct this X check. And here we have these two main conjectures. The idea is that if we combine these two conjectures, the geometric conjecture and the algebraic conjecture together, we should get a heuristic construction of the mirror variety. Um, actually, uh, ideas uh, for doing this uh, construction, I think uh, there have been uh, various proposals uh, uh, by Fukaya, uh, Kondasevich, and the many symplectic geometers. Um, and I uh, I think Jun Wu also made a contribution to this uh, uh, problem. Um, but uh, uh, doing it in the symplectic uh, uh, world, uh, it's very uh, hard, and usually we need a lot of assumptions. Uh, today, I would like to illustrate this idea in a slightly different uh, language. Uh, so, uh, for illustration purpose, uh, I will do it in the case. I will explain it in the case of log Calabial varieties. Um, so, uh, I will illustrate this idea for the case of log Calabial varieties. Uh, it's basically because in this case, the mirror X check will be just an affine variety. So X check will be spec of an algebra and A, and we call A the mirror algebra. And in this case, it's particularly transparent, I would say, because now to describe the mirror, uh, all we need to do is just to describe the algebra. So it is a, so we will describe this, al this algebra A in an explicit way. We will describe the underlying vector space of the algebra A and then the multiplication rule. How do we multiply the elements in the algebra? Uh, in other words, the structure constants. So uh, actually, the, the, what I will explain will also work uh, in, for more general Calabial. Uh, but today, I will tell the story in the log Calabial case. And the different uh, from a symplectic uh, world where we need uh, usually some assumptions about singularities of uh, like of SYZ vibration, 
uh, here we don't need any assumptions. It will work for any uh, affine local B variety. Um, maybe you would like, maybe you say why it's affine, maybe you like projective uh, variety, it's okay. Actually, uh, this affine variety also has natural compactification. Uh, instead of algebra, we just consider we have a natural grading on some algebra and we take proj, we will get a projective variety. So let me just focus on the affine case. Okay. Yeah. So, so now I will explain how to uh, define this mirror algebra. Now I reduce the question about mirror construction just to a question about constructing an algebra. So I'll explain how to define the mirror algebra and how to define the structure constants. Are there any questions for now? Okay, if there are no questions, I just uh, keep uh, going. Uh, here is our setup. We have U, smooth log calabial variety. We fix, start with U, some smooth log calabial variety over uh, any field of characteristic zero K. And we have, uh, we fix some normal crossing compactification uh, Y of U and let D be the complement. So this, that's an, you, an example you can keep in mind. If we have toric variety, then it's just uh, gives an example. But more generally, you can blow up some strata in the boundary of a toric variety and take strict transform of the, of the boundary. Uh, then this gives also an example of this local ABL. Uh, of course, uh, not all local ABL varieties are obtained from such blow ups. And uh, our theory work for general uh, local ABL. So the goal of my talk is to construct the mirror variety uh, X check, which is spec A of any smooth affine local ABL variety X uh, with a condition called the maximal boundary. So, so Tony, this uh, construction will depend on the Y, right? Ah, that's a good, very good question. Uh, it depends on Y in, in only very slightly. Uh, because eventually it's really only about a uh, mirror of U. So it depends on Y a little bit. Uh, and we know how it depends on Y, uh, how it changes when we change Y. And uh, yeah, maybe one way I can say is that somehow uh, what we will construct, it's not just a single mirror, but a family. And the generic fiber will not depend on Y. Okay. And this yeah, is on, on the blow up, it, it changes? It changes in, uh, it somehow, you can think of Y, just a place where we will keep track of uh, some homology class of curves. Mm -hmm. So it's it changes very little. Okay. Yeah, we know we uh we uh, wrote down completely how it changes with respect to the change of y. All right, that's nice. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, here we have an assumption about maximal boundary. It means that the essential part of D has a zero stratum. Uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, I will also give an intrinsic definition a little bit later. Uh, this construction is necessary for mirror symmetry because uh, in mirror symmetry story, we assume this large complex structure limit and in the local color BL case, it corresponds to this mirror uh, maximal boundary condition. Yeah. So, so now we will construct the mirror algebra A by generators uh, and the structure constants. Uh, as I just uh, uh, mentioned to Jun Wu, in fact, we will not just con construct one algebra. We will actually, or one variety, we will construct a family. 
that's also how mirror symmetry works uh, all the time. We need to consider a mirror family. And here, instead of just one algebra, actually, we will con construct a family. So we will have a family spec A over spec R. R is our base. And this spec A will be an R algebra. OK, so first, let me explain. Uh, maybe let me explain what is R. So R, the base, our base R, it's really like a bookkeeping device for curve classes. So it's just the monoid ring of uh, the cone of curves um, in Y. In other words, it's direct sum of copies of uh, Z uh, over all possible curve classes. And we denote the we denote the base vectors by by this z to the beta, just a notation. So once we know what is R, and now I want to define an R algebra A. So first I define A as an R module. Um, I I define the generators of A as an R module, uh, to be the set, to be the set which is the set of integer the set I denote by SKUZ uh, called the set of integer points in the essential skeleton of U. Um, so actually, it makes sense. Uh, I will introduce what is essential skeleton, and then you will see what are integer points. But uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, there is a kind of a definition, quick definition by hand, which is zero union multiples of uh, so m nu multiples of nu and nu is essential divisorial valuation on the field of rational functions on u essential means that the volume form has first order pole uh, along that divisor okay so this this will be the index set for for other generators. In other words, uh, A will just be the free R module with basis in this uh, integer points in the essential skeleton. So, so you also fix a volume form on U? Uh, it's log Calabi also, it's unique. It's unique. Up to scaling. Okay. Yeah. It's like a Calabria, you have a unique volume form up to scaling, just- uh, Up, up uh, to scaling by constant. By constant, yes. Mm -hmm. So pole or something, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so, so I defined what is R and I defined A as an R module generated by the integer points in the essential skeleton and now it uh, remains to define the multiplication rule. In other words, how we multiply these uh, base elements. So R is free, A is a free R module. I just define it uh, as, uh, and we just define it as free R module. So in other words, it's direct sum of copies of R over all integer points uh, in the essential skeleton. And we denote the, the base vectors by theta p uh, because this, these are related to theta functions. Um, and we also call them theta functions. It's a generalization of theta functions uh, for abelian varieties. So, okay, so now, all we need to do is to say how we multiply these theta functions together. Um, so we have uh, given some integer points in the essential skeleton, P1 to Pn. We want to, now I want to say, how do we multiply these theta functions? Um, okay, we multiply these theta functions and then we, we write it as sum over theta Q for all Q in the, in the ba basis, because theta q is a basis. So 
for the product, I just expand it in the basis. And the coefficient is uh, is in R because A was a, a, A is supposed to be a R algebra. And then for, for the coefficient in R, I can just write it as uh, by as the element in R, which is a sum over this all, all curve classes. So so why why there are n inputs here, not two? Uh, not... It's more general. It's just uh, we you can take n equals two. So, but uh, it's a uh, n well, n is three. It means take multiplication twice. Yes, it's take uh, take three things together. Okay, so it's determined by to the n equals to two case or not? It's true. Yes. Okay. So okay. we we can define this number uh for all n, and then of course we sh it's something to prove that uh, for example three things multiplied together defined using this relation is equal to I first multiply the first two and then multiply with the third, or I first multiply the second and the third, and then I multiply with the first, it's associativity. I see, okay. Yeah, and that's one of the hard uh, part in the theory to prove the associativity. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so exactly for the purpose of associativity, for the definition of the product, we only need n equal to two, but to prove associativity, we also need n equals three. Yeah, so now let's just do it for all n. Uh, and it remains to define the structure constant, uh, this chi here, which is which will be an integer number. Maybe that's another nice thing about this, uh, the approach I'm going to explain, because we really get now mirrors, everything is defined over integers. Okay, so how are we, going to get this number, this integer number. Um, yeah, so as I said, we will be combining ideas from these two big conjectures, the SYZ conjecture and the HMS conjecture. And that's actually a pretty long story, how we combine these two conjectures and then we say something about the structure constants. Um, it really involves all, a lot of considerations from uh, Fukaya category and the wall crossing structures. Uh, to, here I will just give the final uh, answer what we are we should do. So combining all the ideas together, it suggests that the structure constants are supposed to be given by the counts of the following following holomorphic disks in U. So what are they? Um, yeah. Um, we are multiplying the theta functions associated to, to this um, piece, these integer points in the essential skeleton. So let's write it as, uh, in this explicit way, multiples of some divisorial valuation. And uh, we assume that this divisorial valuation nu j is just given by some component in the boundary. Uh, it's always possible after some blow up. Then heuristically, this structure constant is should simply count disks, holomorphic disks in Y uh, that look like this, this red disk. And it's supposed to satisfy four conditions. Uh, first, we ask that the disk intersects a uh, component, intersects every component dj with order mj. Like it touches these places with given order. And the next, we ask that the boundary of the disk should map to some point near q. via the SYZ vibration. So the SYZ vibration is a map from this log color BL to the essential skeleton. And we want that under the map, this circle should map to some point near Q. And furthermore, 
since XYZ vibration is torus vibration, if we take H1 of the fiber, uh, we can view Q also as an element in this H1. Then we ask that this circle to have homology class equal to Q. And, and finally, we, we, we have some curve class here, gamma, and we take care of, we ask in some sense that some relative homology of the disk to be equal to gamma. So this is really the heuristic picture. And it's hard to make sense to do anything uh, in symplectic geometry with this heurist heuristic picture. There are several reasons. Uh, first is that the SYZ vibration, it's not clear how to do in symplectic geometry in general. And the second, even if we assume the existence of SYZ vibration, and we try to do this, we still have trouble because uh, the conditions like two and three, um, it's not easy to make it very precise uh, with the symplectic SYZ vibration. And sorry, Tony, this uh, this yeah. Q is not is it a point or it, it's a circle? Q is a point. Uh, because the boundary is supposed to map to a fiber, right? So so oh, under the oh, SYZ oh, vibration oh. it will go to the a point. Oh, so I see. The fiber of Q is uh, where the boundary lies. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But I'm saying that uh, since the trouble, all the trouble with the complex, the symplectic SYZ vibration, actually here it's really heuristic, very hard to make things explicit here. Very hard to make things precise. Even if we make these things precise and we try to count these disks, uh, it's very hard to count. They they are not really well defined. I think Jin Wu, uh, you know it uh, that we have all these uh, curved A infinity structures, similar things that uh, we don't get a number. We... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I think that's why that's also part of why I stopped working on this. It's it's really too difficult for me. Yeah, it's and here part. the story I'm going to tell is that. Actually, we, we really want to just get a number. Uh, we are in symplectic geometry, we have this complicated uh, structure and uh, probably we can st still use these structures to construct the mirror. Uh, I think Jun Wu did a uh, very interesting work in this direction. Uh, uh, here I'm telling another story where we avoid this complicated structure and we we, our goal is really to get the number of disks uh, well-defined. So, so in order to make these conditions and the counts more precise, the idea is to replace the SYZ vibration by the non-Archimedean SYZ vibration. Yeah, so what do I mean by the, and now let me introduce this non-Archimedean SYZ vibration. So, I I want to say that uh, we we started with things over complex numbers, uh, so what is the non non Archimedean here? Uh, it's very simple. We just equip our base field K, even if it's complex numbers, we just equipped it with the trivial absolute value, uh, which is so we define a new norm, uh, which sends zero to zero and any non-zero element to one. Uh, you know, over complex numbers, we have the usual complex norm. Now we just forget about it and we put this trivial uh, norm. And then K becomes a non-Archimedean field. So like in, in if we start with complex log Calabria variety, we don't change the variety. We 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 just uh, put a different norm, and uh, in algebraic geometry, it's still the same thing. But uh, but the in analytic geometry, it becomes different. 
Because now, uh, you know, if I have something defined over complex numbers, if I use the usual complex norm, then I can consider analytification. Now I don't change the field, but I put a different norm. And then I can do a different kind of analytification. So there's a construction called a Berkovich analytification, and we get a we can do it with respect to this norm, and we get a k-analytic space. And it's many things are analogous uh, in k-analytic geometry compared with complex analytic geometry. Um, just as a uh, uh, quick uh, introduction, uh, this k-analytic space as a set, it's actually built uh, upon the idea of a scheme. So it consists of pairs, cosi and nu, where cosi is a scheme theoretic point, uh, meaning that we put all the prime, not just the maximal ideals, but all the prime ideals. And then nu is an absolute value on the residual field. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah, and uh, and that's what the, the analytification is as a set. And uh, we can also put the topology and then a sheaf of analytic functions in the natural way. That's how this analytic space is defined. And now we are in analytic geometry, also a slightly different kind of complex analytic geometry. So. In particular, we can take norms of everything. Uh, in algebraic geometry, we don't have norm. Analytic means we have norm. So in particular, for the volume form, we can take its norm. Uh, there is a natural norm for over, over the uh, canonical bundle. Uh, there's a name called the Temkin scalar semi norm. Um, and we can take the norm and we get the uh, upper semi-continuous function. Then, oh, sorry, sorry then, Tony, I have a question. So this uh, U analytic is not uh, endowed with a weird topology, and right? it's a, uh, it's not something like growth and dick topology. It's an honest topology on the set. Uh, it, it, it's an honest topology, yes. And uh, one can show that this topological space is locally compact and locally, uh, has connected locally compact and locally has connected compact. yeah i see so that's two properties one can show okay. but it's still pretty weird <laughs> yeah yeah but just uh, technically is not uh, something different yeah okay it yeah it's as a, you know the one dimensional picture it's like an infinite tree something Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Higher dimensional, we don't really know what's going on. We only know the, we know something, which is already, I will mention one thing here okay. about the topology here. So, yeah. So here we define this uh, norm. And then by definition, the essential skeleton uh, of U is the maximum locus of this. Uh, upper semi-continuous function. And, and then the condition that U has maximal boundary is equivalent to the condition that uh, this essential skeleton has maximal dimension. Um, let me give an example. So if we have this like surface Y with a cycle of rational curves D, then the essential skeleton uh, is, uh, is homeomorphic to the dual intersection complex of D. Uh, in this case, we it's like umbrella. We have a uh, array for each component and a cone for each, uh, each corner here. Um, yeah, and then uh, back 
following the seminal work of Berkowitz and uh, then uh, works by Johannes Niges Xu and also I have collaboration with them. Um, following all these works, uh, we can construct a strong deformation retraction tau from the analytic uh, U to the essential skeleton. Uh, and furthermore, we show that it really looks like a SYZ vibration. Yeah, let me say something more. So just now, uh, Jun Wu was asking whether it's a weird topology or nice topology. It's pretty nice, but it's still kind of hard to say it's uh, what it looks like. Here, what's uh, what we say is about its homotopy type, at least, uh, because we have a deformation retraction. Uh, from this topological space to this essential skeleton. And the ske essential skeleton is really a piecewise linear object. Like in this case, it's just uh, this fan. And the furthermore, we show that this retraction map, uh, we show that this retraction map, it really looks like the conjectural, uh, conjectural symplectic SYZ vibration. In the sense that outside the co-dimension two, it's really a torus vibration, but here it's torus vibration in the non-Archimedean sense. Uh, we call it affinoid torus vibration because it's locally given. Uh, it's locally given by the analog uh, of this standard torus vibration, which is we just take analytic. Uh, identification of algebraic torus, and then we take coordinate-wise valuations. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so this really shows that uh, we get something very closely analogous to the uh, conjectural SYZ vibration. And furthermore, the construction is uh, totally, it's, uh, it's now proved completely uh, proven and uh, uh, also explicit. So we call it a non Archimedean as well as if vibration. And the, the idea is to replace the complex, the symplectic as well as if vibration by the non Archimedean one, and then we can do the curve counting there. It, it, it will simplify our, uh, uh, simplify a lot of difficulties for curve counting. Um, yeah, here is a picture. So we have uh, analytic uh, space and uh, we show the, this non-Archimedean SYZ vibration to the essential skeleton. So most of the fibers, they are affinoid torus and uh, we have some singular fiber. And one thing that's really nice about the non-Archimedean vibration is that whenever I consider any curve upstairs, uh, in the analytic space, and I look at its image under the non-Archimedean vibration, we get uh, a piecewise linear, like a graph. Oh, sorry, Tony. So here you don't have to take the dual vibration, as we started with something complex, and you already take look at disks in the complex vibration in this vibration. Uh, even in the original conjecture, we count the disks in the original vibration. Right, we don't do disks in the in the dual vibration. Well, I thought the disks. Uh, ah, the, okay. You're you're starting with the Fukaya side, and that's the yeah the A side. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So here, one really good uh, nice thing about uh, non Archimedean vibration is that uh, whenever whatever curve you take, the image will be this. Uh, piecewise linear graph. It's called a tropical curve. And, and you know, for the symplectic SYZ vibration, the image is something like a thickening of a, red, a fat thing, not as clean as this graph. So, so using this graph or tree, one can make things pretty uh, clean. So now let me explain how we 
now we have this non-Archimedean SYZ vibration and how are we going to uh, make, to do the discounts? In other words, how to make these conditions uh, more uh, precise. So here I just copy pasted my old conditions uh, and, and we wanted to reformulate conditions two and three. Uh, yeah, so now we want to reformulate the conditions two and three, whereas a non-Archimedean SYZ vibration. So since I mentioned that uh, whatever disk we have, under the non-Archimedean SYZ vibration, we just get a, some, a tropical disk, this piecewise linear tree. Now we can formulate the conditions two and three simply in terms of this uh, this tree. So all we have to say is that the root of the tree is close to Q, and then the derivative at the root is equal to the it's also equal to the direction Q. And that's all we need. So now the conditions are very precise, and the, and we are ready. We can just uh, now. It really makes sense to say that uh, let's count uh, analytic disks satisfying all these conditions. Um, but uh, there is another trouble here. Uh, if we count these disks, uh, ideally, of course, uh, we just want. What do we mean to count? Like, ideally we would like to have a finite set of such disks and then the count will be the cardinality of the set uh, but uh, okay so so then usually uh, we consider the moduli space of all such um, uh, disks and uh, in enumerative geometry the usual thing is to take the moduli space if we are lucky, we get a finite set we can count. Otherwise, we do some virtual fundamental class and we still count. But here, if we consider the modular space of such disks, uh, we we run into a trouble is that we find we see a modular space, uh, an infinite dimensional modular space. So let alone uh, of obtaining some finite set, we get an infinite dimensional space. And of course, we can't do virtual class or anything to for this infinite dimensional space. And the reason is pretty simple. So, so for example, let's consider uh, maps from disk to disk, uh, sending the circle to itself. It's like the one dimensional story. So in complex geometry, you know that all the maps from disk to disk, they are parametrized by finitely many parameters. It's a consequence of the Schwarz lemma. Uh, you just remove like all the zeros and eventually apply the Schwarz lemma. And it all such maps are given by explicit formula, I think called the Polashka formula that uh, I found on Wikipedia. Uh, there is, it's just a corollary of uh, Schwarz lemma. And I consider the Schwarz lemma to be really a miracle in complex geometry. Uh, it will not hold in non-Archimedean geometry. In non-Archimedean geometry, all such maps, they are given by power series. Uh, some AIXI, uh, living in so-called Tate algebra, it just means that the norm of AI should converge to zero when I goes to infinity. And furthermore, the condition that the circle maps to itself uh, means that we have the norm of AI equals one for exactly one I. And then the norm for all the other AI is less than one. So here you see that it's the situation is very different from the complex and the case because because 
in the complex analytic case, somehow asking the circle to go to the circle, it's such a stronger, it's such a strong condition that it somehow magically has so much constraints on all the coefficients of the power series. But in the non-Archimedean case, the constraints on the power series, they are only very weak. It's just about the norms of the coefficients. And we see that we can change all these coefficients, infinitely many coefficients, without changing their norm at all, still satisfying all these conditions. But in complex geometry, we cannot arbitrarily change the norm of a power series. It will just completely be completely something different. So that's, I mean, although the SYZ picture in non-Archimedean geometry is much cleaner, but here we see the moduli space, it's like terrible. So yeah, so uh, now the strategy uh, or what we want is uh, how we can get some finite number from this infinite dimensional space. And we must impose further conditions to cut the dimension down to zero. So in particular, we will impose a regularity condition on the boundary circle. I denote the boundary circle by A of this disk delta uh, in order to discard most of the non-Archimedean analytic disks. What I want to say is that uh, I just have too many of them. I, I want to throw away most of them and get only finite number. And uh, how I throw away most of them, I want to impose some regularity condition. And in some sense, I only want to consider disks whose boundary behavior is kind of nice. Yeah, so what do I mean here? Uh, the observation is that the boundary circle of the disk lies in the place of our target with affinoid torus vibration. And the affinoid torus vibration means that it's locally isomorphic to this uh, standard torus vibration. So we see that the boundary lies in this kind of standard place and we want we just want this map from the boundary circle to this uh, algebraic torus to be as simple as possible. Yeah. So, so we propose after analyzing no low dimensional examples, we propose the following boundary condition. We ask that this map now we have a map from the circle to the standard uh, algebraic torus, and we ask that. If I extend this circle, uh, like in the opposite direction, I should obtain a map from a disk to, to some toric compactification of this algebraic torus such that this opposite disk touches the toric boundary at only the zero point. That's in some sense the simplest map we can consider. Simplest map from this kind of circle to the algebraic torus. I just want it to be boundary of like a very simple straight disk. And geometrically, what do we mean? Geometrically, it means that we are gluing the toric variety. This, this toric variety Tn, uh, the analytic toric variety, to the to our analytified target y along a small domain g this gray domain uh, and over this small domain we have the trivial affinoid torus vibration so the idea is that we want to impose some boundary condition on this circle and we observe that this circle lies in this gray domain g where we have the trivial torus vibration and the trivial torus vibration means that it just sits like in the algebraic torus. So then we want to say that the way it sits in the algebraic torus is it's really simple in the sense that it's kind of a boundary of a straight disk in the opposite direction. 
And this is our boundary regularity condition for this uh, boundary. And geometrically, it means that we are gluing a toric variety to our original log color BL along some domain. It only now it only makes sense in analytic geometry because in algebraic geometry you cannot take uh, this kind of small domain. And the question becomes uh, counting closed curves now because now we once we have the opposite disk we can glue them together along the circle and we get a closed rational curve. So now it becomes uh, counting closed rational curves uh, C in this very strange glued space, such that this uh, red part, this red part uh, maps to Y. That was the disk we were interested in. And it satisfies our previous four conditions. And then the orange, orange part, orange disk goes to, goes to the toric variety uh, in the straight way. Okay, so now we reduced, by imposing this boundary condition, we somehow reduced the problem about counting non-Archimedean analytic disks to the problem of counting closed rational curves, uh, albeit in the strange target space, this uh, artificial glued target space. Yeah, so, so then that's the, basic geometric idea, but uh, you may say that uh, how is it possible to ever count the curves in such a glued space? Um, in other words, the main technical theorem we have to show to make the count, to show that the count is ever possible is to prove certain properties of the modular space of curves into this uh, strange glued target space. So here we we really had a lot of worry because usually when we count the curves, it only makes sense if the target space is projective. And our new target space by this strange uh, non-Archimedean like surgery or gluing procedure, this new target space, it's not at all projective. And it's not even proper and not even separated because you know, it's like we are gluing two analytic space along some domain. You can imagine gluing two complex manifold. You have two projective uh, or proper complex manifold and then you glue along some domain. And it's it's not going to be a manifold anymore. It's not even uh, separated. Uh, so in non-Archimedean geometry, whatever we do, either you glue along closed or along along open, there are always trouble. So 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 really, the question is, how is it ever possible to count <coughs> curves in such a glued space? <clears throat> Yeah, that's the main technical difficulty that kind of, uh, I had that idea uh, really for a long time. Uh, and uh, from many discussions with uh, Maxim Kondasevich, but uh, really, I didn't really had the uh, enough uh, Make make time or courage to really try this. So uh, it's pretty technical uh, to study these spaces. Uh, let me give the basic idea why it eventually uh, can work out. Is that uh, the basic idea is that as long as so. So we really, this target is really bad. It's hard to imagine doing curve counting in such target. But the observation is that as long as we can keep the circle away from the boundary of the domain G, then the rest of the curve 
should not feel the non-separated locus. What we worry is really when we glue along the gray domain, then we get things like non-separateness issues at the boundary of the gray domain. And the idea is that if we do things properly and we keep this circle away from the boundary of the gray domain, then the curve that we are supposed to count, they, it should not feel the boundary. In other words, it should not feel the non-separated locus of the target. So eventually things should work out like this non-separated this issue should not really cause trouble. Yeah. So, so now in my ongoing work with Sean, we really eventually spent the effort uh, to uh, figure out all the details. And here is the precise, now I can give the precise statement. So, so in, a precise, in, in our precise statement, we have to fix a marked point Q on the circle A, as well as marked points PI, where C touches the boundary the curve touches the boundary of both Y and T. And then as usual in enumerative geometry, we fix a modular space of such curves. We consider modular space of such curves, M U beta, and we consider map taking domain of the curve, uh, which goes to, uh, to a domain in this M zero N. And then we also take evaluation of the marked point Q on the circle. Then the main theorem, uh, it confirms that uh, our heuristic idea eventually can work out. It shows that phi, this map above, is a finite a tau cover over an open neighborhood of the essential skeleton of the target. So we get a finite a tau map and that's really the best we can hope for because finite et al, essentially it's like a covering. We can take its degree and the degree gives the desired count of non-Archimedean analytic disks. And furthermore, we show that actually they really give us the structure constants. And with this degree, we, give, we obtain a commutative associative mirror algebra A. So here we get the mirror algebra. And furthermore, we can say something about the geometric, more geometric properties of this mirror. Now, if we take a spec, we obtain a flat family. Furthermore, we prove that when we take a spec, we obtain a flat family of uh, log color BL varieties, which have reasonable singularities. So we show Gorenstein SLC with normal and uh, log canonical generic fiber. Uh, that's our main theorem. Um, maybe I think I have one minute left. Let's just uh, quickly, let me quickly say something about the ingredients in the proof of the main theorem. Uh, so the main technical statement is really this finite a downness and it 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 consists of actually three different uh, things. Uh, so smoothness, relative dimension zero, and the properness. Uh, for smoothness, uh, we need to use some non-Archimedean deformation theory that uh, based on my previous works with Mauro Porta. Uh, we developed the theory somehow motivated by a slightly different uh, question. And then uh, properness is uh, the trickiest part. Uh, in non-Archimedean geometry, it consists of two things. One is being topologically proper, another is being bound without a boundary. So let me just say that both are proved using formal model and uh, and there are some geometric uh, considerations to be made uh, for the proof of uh, properness. Uh, 
which is related to all this uh, wall crossing phenomenon. Um, yeah, maybe let me stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Well, then I'll ask. Uh, so, so can this work? Can you, can you make a non-Archimedean for Kaya category? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. So this actually, I don't know how to make it work. Uh, here, what I explained is really to construct the mirror, to construct the mirror. And you see that we use the non-Archimedean geometry, but the mirror we construct has nothing to do with, has nothing non-Archimedean. So we start with a complex uh, uh, calabial or log calabial, and we do the non-Archimedean construction, and then we get back something like uh, ordinary, right? Because what we get back is this just a spec A over spec R. Look, uh, I think maybe I can just show this. What we get is this spec A over spec R, and everything defined over integers, you can take uh, base change to complex numbers. So it's everything is ordinary. So somehow we use the non Archimedean only as a tool uh, in the construction. We start with complex and uh, the mirror we get is also still complex. Um, yeah, then, so here you can think of non-Archimedean geometry it's as a tool. Eventually, both the input and the output, they are usual uh, complex varieties. Uh, and then after the construction, of course, uh, we can ask what kind of mirror symmetry statement uh, we can prove. Because here it's about the construction of the mirror. It's not yet about the uh, mirror symmetry, uh, these dualities. Yeah. And then, yeah, then for mirror symmetry duality, we kind of have different levels. We have like uh, Hodge numbers and then uh, things like uh, uh, D modules, this quantum connection and, uh, and, and then we have homological mirror symmetry. So I, I mean, the next thing I would try to do is to prove uh, this uh, like Hodge theoretical mirror symmetry from this construction. Uh, here we have an algebraic, algebraic construction and then the goal is to identify this like D module or connection from the A model with the connection from the B model. Uh, I think yeah. that's something I would like to consider. And then how much we can do for the homological mirror symmetry? Uh, it's not my expertise. Uh, and, uh, and again, here really the formulation, the homological mirror symmetry we want to do will be the original version. It will not be a non-Archimedean version because we use the non-Archimedean only like uh, in the mm -hmm. as a tool, everything is is complex. So we just if we you if we want to prove mirror symmetry, it will be the usual Foucault category and the usual derived category of coherent sheaves. Mm -hmm. No, I, I was uh, because uh, you say that I, your proof is uh, this, for example, associativity is a bit like uh, the the quantum product, right? Associativity commutative. It's kind of, uh, yeah, but this associativity is somehow easier to understand. I see. Because, you know, for the quantum product, uh, uh, the associativity is kind of a reformulation of the WDVV equation. Right. It's for me like an algebraic game of this uh, algebraic reformulation. Here, associativity, it's really, like for the mirror algebra, it's like associativity on the nose. We just, the mirror algebra is of course supposed to be a commutative associative algebra. Mm -hmm.
But because I was thinking about this, uh, in the it, people are complaining about Fokaya category, even the A yeah. infinity structure, right? Uses a lot more modular spaces. Uh, virtual yeah, yes, models. of course. I mean, uh, you think if uh, we can define the Fukaya category in a more algebraic way? Yeah, yeah. Or I even think uh, integral in, using yours. Yeah, I think. Of course, I mean it's really uh, it's a great hope that one can eventually Fukaya category is just a category. So. Whatever means we can use to or construct. Perhaps just uh, just uh, between Lagrangian fibers, right? In your case, if you change, uh, you, you in your case you have one fiber, one point Q. If you have several Q, then you mean how to define the morphisms? Like yeah, uh, yeah here. But it looks. I, uh, <laughs> I think for alternative ways to construct the Foucault category like in a more algebraic way using less uh, less moduli space in symplectic geometry. This, I don't know how much non-Archimedean theory can help, okay. but I remember that uh, Kondosevich, he had some notes uh, related to skeleton and uh, some algebraic construction of Fukaya category. Maybe you know it, some called skeleton of symplectic manifold or something. Ah, uh, this other, yeah, this other sheaf theory. Okay, but it's very different from... It's different, but I guess it's kind of in the goal of uh, constructing Fukaya category. Like uh, maybe that, that kind of idea can be better adapted to the non-Archimedean framework, maybe. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Instead of using Lagrangians, things like that. Right. Yeah, that's true. All right. Are there other questions from the audience? No, okay. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, thank you. Tony. Uh, thank you, Jin Wu, for the nice invitation. One. Learned a lot. Okay, uh, we'll just okay. dismiss. <laughs> well, so the um, seminar you are having it online, or in, there's nobody in the classroom, or you are in your office, maybe. Yeah, I'm uh, in my office. I see. So, so you are still having online seminars. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, we we are doing in person. I'm now I'm only doing in-person seminars. I, that's that's nice. Yeah, I have a weekly seminar with uh, students. Uh, I, actually, I have a mirror symmetry seminar with students every week, and we also have an algebraic geometry seminar uh, every week. Are you running so, the seminar both? I'm running the mirror symmetry seminar by myself, and the algebraic geometry seminar. We have two postdocs running and running it. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we are doing everything in person now. It has been That's one nice. year. Yeah. That's nice. Um, oh, we, we also want China. China can also do the same thing, maybe. Yeah, well, I also want to travel a little bit. Not, uh, it's been a long time. Actually, I don't know now. In China, you have less restrictions or more restrictions? How? Uh... It's about. It's uh, maybe a bit less than one month ago. Okay, that's Almost. good. Uh, uh, but only maybe five percent. If you, if you. Uh, I yeah. see. So. Anyway, I hope to run, uh, meet with you in person in the future. Yeah, what are you working on these days? I uh, work on this categorical enumerative invariance. Let's recover. Oh, is it related to this uh, this Andre Kaladararu? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Oh, you have. We did, we did the work together, and then I'm still doing it. Uh, yeah. He's still doing it too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, well, that's uh, there are a lot of things to to work on. Would you mind giving some talks about it in our seminars? 
Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I, I'd like Categorical to... invariance. Yeah, I can do that, definitely. Are you but familiar it will have to be with... online, right? <laughs> you can, I mean, uh, if you like, you can travel to our place. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't have any restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can, uh, of course, doing online is easier. So I I heard that this categorical invariance uh, there in the beginning there were some ideas maybe from Costello's paper. No, he defined it in the beginning. I he see. defined it in uh, two thousand four and two thousand five. Also Konsevich as well. Uh, Costello's paper cited Konsevich's talk, and uh, he says he did it in a different method, and Konsevich was the first one do it but nothing was on the internet i didn't see anything but then the uh, the, the paper is kind of not a very it's kind of very uh, philosophical and a bit vague costello's uh, paper yeah yeah and so later we uh with uh, uh andre calderaro we kind of class clarified uh the, the, the this definition his definition uh, basically I, it, uh, it's uh, we want to recover gromovita invariance from uh, fukaya category of course that's the uh, uh, yeah i mean i of course that's the really great if we can really get but the, kind of a higher genus but the comparison is difficult but now kind of we moved to a different goal. <laughs> what is because, your new goal? Uh, because when you are in the derived category of coherent shifts, uh, you get uh, invariance uh, complex numbers as invariants, and there are new invariants, and that's what I'm doing now. Uh, is it related to this paper uh, of uh, Katakov, Kondasevich, Pontiff, where they also consider? Yeah, some, they uh, they also uh, when they do this Hodge theory paper. Yeah, they seem to also say something similar but uh, uh, but i don't think uh <laughs> conservative may be too busy to write uh, other important things yeah i see so actually last year with my students i organized some seminar related to this uh katak of conservative pontiff paper it's yeah, so, Hodge. yeah so th that paper basically recover hodge structure wants to at least they want which, to uh, which uh, which is uh, in my view which would be genus zero invariance right because uh, that's how classical mirror symmetry works with genus zero counting yeah i think their goal is to recover yeah their goal is exactly to recover genus zero this quantum this uh, like hodge a model hodge structure right but that paper is already 2008 that's after the costello's paper right but it's different method costello is like a, so hodge structure is a, is a variation method to recover this invariance and you say the higher genus costello is about higher genus uh, costello is about higher genus and it's pointwise even in genus zero is does not require variation of hodge structure it's pointwise definition so point it's, wise, what, it's, which it's, a, point it's like when you define wise. it's when you define a gromovita invariance right in genus zero you have two structures you either have the frobenius manifold structure yeah or you can go ahead and define uh what are these invariants within zero and marked points the numbers you mean the numbers yeah so this exactly. definition is like the numbers the number are exactly the same as Frobenius manifold because Frobenius manifold is given by the potential and the coefficients That's are right. exactly these numbers. That's right. But from the from the Hodge structure, it's more like you get a variation Hodge structure matching with Frobenius without producing numbers first. And Costello yeah. is like producing numbers directly without without deformation. I see, producing numbers, and that's what you are doing too, to produce yeah, numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I hope you can talk about it maybe in our seminar. 
maybe you already talked about a lot and <laughs> it uh, would no. be great if you just yeah yeah like the, the uh, maybe we can yeah you can email me or can email you about time i i'm i'm mostly fine when is your seminar uh usually i'm i'm doing my seminar so for this story uh we have I'm doing my mirror symmetry seminar uh, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. my time, which is 6 a.m. your time. But uh, I can move it later to like... It's, uh, six, uh, it's a 6 a.m. my time? No. Yeah, I think we are for our... Yeah, so I can do it at 4 p.m., which will be your 8 a.m. Will it be to... That's the only possibility otherwise if we no, do no, it, it's a, I, it's a, wait wait no uh, the the timing is different so you're you're usually doing it what 6 p.m i do it in my 2 p.m uh, 2 p.m which is your 6 a.m is it yeah no, right. So I, I know how to compute because no, I no, my it. 6 a.m. would be it's my 2 p.m. Okay. I'm pretty sure because with my parents I usually <laughs> call, so I know how to <laughs> how to change the time. Yeah, I okay. know how to change the time, but usually I forget to change the date. <laughs> Today, for example, it's my Monday, but your Tuesday. Uh, yeah, usually, okay. yeah, it works. Uh, it works for me. Uh, so. But your six a.m. is too early for you. Uh, I think. Yeah, that's Wednesday six. Uh, I can make it work. It's it's it's. Fine. We can start later, like uh, starting from your eight a.m. Maybe yeah, one. That, that also works. That that that's then that's better. Yeah. So maybe let me write to you be later because now we already have some seminars scheduled yeah i have mark gross visiting caltech now so oh. he has been giving a lot of talks and uh, maybe in january or february will be better let me write to you then. okay hey, thank you so oh, much thank you. For the, thank you for the invitation so okay. let's keep in touch. Mm -hmm. Bye.